Glad to see you here. Welcome. Um, um, the health unit uh, changed the rules on us a few weeks ago, so we used to be able to take our masks off once we were seated in the pews, but now they want us to keep them on through the whole service. <coughs> Chris and I, being 12 feet away, are okay with taking it off, so that's uh, kind of how we do it here. So we're glad you're here. Welcome. And we want to open our service in prayer together. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity we have to come into your house and be together and uh, to worship your name. Lord, each one of us has come from different places. Each one of us has different things that are kind of weighing heavy on our hearts and our minds, uh, whether it's due to COVID or due to our own personal circumstances. And Lord, I just pray now that your peace would come and just flood through our hearts and flood through our minds, that we'd feel and know and sense your presence and that you would prepare our hearts and minds to hear what you'd want to say to us this morning, whether it's through a prayer, through a scripture reading, through a song, through the message. Lord, I pray that, that you would give us ears to hear what it is you want to say to us this day. Lord, please uh, forgive us, Lord, for the things we've done this week that have hurt you and hurt others and hurt ourselves. And Lord, forgive us for the things that we failed to do and neglected to do that you would have wanted us to do. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that it is your desire that, that we, we know you in a very close and intimate way. And I pray, Lord, that, uh, that this morning would be a part of growing that relationship. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We um, aren't singing as much as we normally do at First Baptist, because that's something that, again, the health unit is asking that we kind of limit the amount of singing that we do, and we do it with masks on. And so what we've been doing is trying to find different ways of worshiping God and letting God connect with us beyond music. And so one of the ways we've been doing it is just through scripture reading, but through a, a method of scripture reading that allows for reflection and allows for really thinking about what it is we're reading and letting God speak to us through it. So we do it in a very slow, methodical way. And we want to do a passage, a psalm actually, that I think Ruth may have done with us before, but it is absolutely my favorite psalm. Psalms, the 150 psalms in the Bible, and they are originally songs and the music has been lost to history, but we still have the words, they're poems. And they're, many of them are very honest. Many of them were written by King David and other psalm writers. Um, who were very honest about the, the hard times they were going through. And they wrote down their feelings on paper, parchment, whatever, um, to express to God how they were feeling. And some, so sometimes the Psalms, some of the Psalms are very raw and very honest, but they never, they're, they're never left that way. Always in a Psalm, you take that rawness, that, that struggle, and you turn it upwards towards God and ask for his help. And most, if not all, the Psalms always end with what I call an uptick at the end. There's always a, a message of hope, even in the deepest, darkest times, no matter how dark a Psalm may start, there's always this message of hope at the end. And Psalm 13 is a little six verse Psalm that is just classic like that. It's got that three elements there of God, and it's like, God, this situation is terrible. God, I need your help. God, thank you for your help. And so we want to kind of go through this together. And so you can do whatever is most comfortable with you, whether you want to close your eyes, just to help you focus on, and I'll, I'll read this passage to you slowly and allow it to speak to your hearts. And maybe the words that are here may speak exactly to how you're feeling and may be able to express, help you express to God what it is that you're going through. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long? How long, O Lord? How long must I wrestle? With my thoughts. How long, O oh Lord? And every day, every day, 
have sorrow in my heart. How long, O Lord? How long? How long will my enemy triumph over me? God, look, look on me and answer, O Lord, my God. Look on me and answer, O Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. Give light, or else. My enemy will say, I have overcome him. My foes will rejoice when I fall. But, but, but I trust you. I trust you. I trust in your unfailing love. And my heart rejoices, rejoices in your salvation. And I will sing. I will sing. I will sing to you, Lord. For he has been good to me. Lord, you are good. You are good. You are good. May his word speak to our hearts now and continue to speak to our hearts in the time to come. We're going to read Matthew chapter 25. If you've got your Bible on your phone, you can look it up. Or you can just listen as we read it. Matthew chapter 25. Again, it, meaning the kingdom of God, will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold, and see, I have gained two more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and, and hid your gold in the ground. See, here, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where, where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take your bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Lord, thank you 
for the way you taught, that you taught in parables that had deeper meanings than just what's apparent. And I pray, Lord, that as we explore this parable, you give us ears to hear and hearts to understand what it is you're trying to say to us through this passage. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time, Lord, it's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. I think I tend to be a fairly conservative person when it comes to taking risks. Pretty much every area of my life. <laughs> maybe that's why I'm still single. I don't know, maybe. Um, but I do have this secret desire on my bucket list to one day go parachute jumping, which I know makes most sense. I can't even climb a ladder to the fifth rung, right, Rob? <laughs> but something inside of me is like, one day I want to jump out of, the, of a plane. But in general, I am fairly risk averse. I wouldn't be someone who would invest money in a risky venture, like no matter how much the rate of return could possibly be if there was a chance that I could lose what I invested. As such, there's been many times over the years when I read this passage in Matthew 25, and I would identify with the third guy. I could see myself doing that, burying my bag of gold, or hiding it under the mattress, and giving it back to my master when, when he came back home, in hopes that the other two guys would have invested their bags of gold and lost their shirts, and I'd be the only one, you know, giving my master back money. And he'd be happy about that. But in reality, the way Jesus tells this parable, it's the third guy in this story who is actually the fool. He is the one that the master is displeased with. So what is it about this story that I've been getting wrong? And what can we learn from this parable? Now, first of all, because the way this passage is translated in almost every other translation except the one I read, many of us who grew up in church think that this story is about our talents because it uses, instead of the word bags of gold, it uses the word talents because a talent was a unit of currency in biblical times. So some would say that in, if you see bags of gold, they would think, well, this parable only has to do with money. But like many of Jesus' parables, the application can be very broad. I think what we're, we are safe to say that this parable is talking about the various things that God has given us to use for his glory during our time on earth, whether it's money, our talents, our specific gifts, the personality that he's given us. This parable is actually placed, yet it's important to, to look at a section of scripture in its context, what comes before it and what comes after it. And this parable was placed in a series of parables and teachings about the second coming of the Lord, about the kingdom of God which is to come. And the overarching message of all of the parables is to be ready. To be ready for when the master comes home. To be ready for when the Lord returns to bring this age of time to a close. So with all that background in mind, in mind let's take a look at this parable. So the master is going on a journey and he entrusts his wealth to his servants. And to one, he gives five bags of gold. Now, some scholars think that each bag of gold in today's currency would be worth about a half a million dollars. So this is no small thing that is being entrusted to these three servants. And the master doesn't distribute his wealth equally. He, he does it, the scripture says, according to their abilities. He, to one, he gives five bags, to another two, and to another one. And none of them are recorded as, as complaining, saying, hey, why did he get five? I only got two. There's a commandment in the Ten Commandments that we rarely talk about. It's not something we often consider when we think of the top ten list, that are things that need forgiving, that need rooting out of our lives. But it's there in the top ten list just the same. And it's something that, if it takes root, can really make our lives miserable. And that sin is called coveting, coveting, desperately wanting what someone else has to the point of both wishing that person ill and also becoming extremely dissatisfied with your own lot in life and with what you have. And in this parable, the servants with one and two bags of gold could easily covet the servant who was given five. And sometimes when we look around us, whether it's in the church or in the world in general, we could look at others and say, well, why did God bless them with so much? And why hasn't he done that with me? 
Why does their life seem so easy and my life seem so hard? Why is that person getting so, so much recognition for what they're doing and I'm doing the same thing and I'm getting ignored? I mean, I could do what they're doing. <laughs> I could do it even better. It can be easy in a small church like ours to, to look at other churches with more people and more money and wonder, wonder why. Why the difference? And even begin to covet what others might have. In this parable, Jesus shows three servants who have each been given three different amounts of giftings. And the implied message the master is sending to these servants is that they are to work with what they've been given and to expand their gifts, to expand their influence. They aren't to sit back and, and wish their circumstances were different. They're to work with what they've got. Now, each of us is in a different place of our, in our lives, and God has given each of us unique gifts, gifts that are they're different from people around us. Our opportunities to serve are different. We may even find ourselves in a different place now than we were, say, 10, 20, 40 years ago. And we can perhaps fall into the trap of thinking, well, if I can't do what I used to be able to do for the Lord, well, how can I possibly be of any good? The Lord can never work through me to make a difference in someone's life. But the truth is that God has given each one of us what we need in order to make a difference in this world for him, to serve Jesus and to make his name known and to present, to make his name known in our, in our own life, in our own circumstances. We are not meant to waste our time looking at what we used to be, and wishing we could be back there again. We're not meant to look at those around us and covet their gifts and their opportunities and become frustrated with our own lot in life. God has given us what we need, and he's called us to work with what we've got. I was looking at the calendar, and I think it's, I think it's actually today, this week, that marks four years that I've been your official pastor at First Baptist Church, not counting pulpit supply opportunities. And one of the mottos for myself that I've worked with over these last few years is the idea is that we've got to work with what we've got. Work with the gifts and opportunities that God has given us. There are a number of things that, that a church could do that we realistically couldn't. It's just beyond our grasp right now. But that doesn't mean we're supposed to do nothing. We as a church, as individuals, need to examine what, what is it that God's given us? What is it that God's given me? And put it to use so that we can grow as Christians, grow as a church. Experience the joy of the master as, as he works through us to make a difference for him. When I was in university back then, back, way back when, Stone Ages, there was a Christian singer named Amy Grant. She's still around. You still hear her song sometimes on the radio. And she had a song that I really liked, that I really identified with. Um, She's only two years older than me, so when this record came out and I bought it, she would have been the same age writing the song as I was listening to it, so it really spoke to me. And the chorus goes like this. It's a prayer, and it says, All I ever have to be is what you've made me. Any more or less would be a step out of your plan. As you daily recreate me, help me always keep in mind that I only have to do what I can find. And all I ever have to be all I have to be, all I ever have to be, is what you've made me. God has given each and every one of us something to do with our lives, something to strive for. And he has called us to strive for the goals that he has set before us. Not someone else's goals, not some other church's goals, not the world's goals, but his goals for us. Let the expectations that we place on ourselves be his, not, not our own expectations or the expectations of someone else. Now, we can take this idea and kind of twist it because we humans are good at taking good ideas and twisting it to suit ourselves. And there can be this false interpretation of what God expects of us. And I think that's portrayed in the third servant, the one who I said is probably most like me. We could take the gifts and opportunities God has given us and rather than taking a risk, for Jesus, rather than stepping out of our comfort zone and serving him, rather than doing something which would broaden our influence for the gospel in our lives. Instead, we bury it. We bury what we've been given. We, we hide it. We, 
We hide our light under a bushel. We don't make any use of it. And at the end of time, we come before God and we unwrap it and we simply give him back what he's given us, our salvation. Wow, God. This is amazing. So this is what heaven is. Awesome. And look, look, God, here, here. here, here here's the salvation that you gave me. I accepted Christ as my savior and, and I did my best to protect that. I mean, I went to church every week. I never really did anything really bad. Never really fell away. Never, never really made any waves. I, I, I think I did pretty good. What, what, what was that, God? What have I done with the 40 years I knew you? Well, well, I just told you. Here it is, here it is. What, what's that, God? Well, I've always kind of thought that. You know, I always kind of felt your spirit was kind of nudging me and that I, I needed to do something more with what you gave me. But you know, things were going pretty good with my job and with my family, and I really didn't want to mess it up. So, so God, when do I get to hear well done? God has given us his gift of salvation. But it's a gift he wants us to pay forward. With the gift of salvation, he has placed his spirit in us, and his spirit spurs us on to love and good deeds. His spirit gives us a passion and a desire to serve God and to love God and to, to serve people and to love people. The spirit gives us the supernatural ability to step beyond what we feel we're capable of doing. All we have to be is what God made us, but the reality is that often we're settling for far less than what God has made us to be. God has us here as a church, as individuals for a purpose. And that purpose is very unique to each one of us. I don't know, maybe it's just pastors who do this, but in the church, I find that we can be very prone to comparison prone to comparing ourselves to others. Pastors are terrible for this when they go to the pastor's conferences and they compare themselves. How many do you have in a Sunday morning service? Well, we have so many. And you compare yourself and you come away feeling kind of lich. But when we do that, we feel like we're, we're not enough. But look at the parable. The servant who was given five bags of gold came back with 10. And the master was pleased and shared his joy with the servant, placing him in a position of being responsible for even more stuff in his empire. And the servant who was given two bags of gold came back with 10 and the master was pleased. Oh, wait a minute, that's not how it goes. Okay, hang on a second. The servant who was given two bags of gold came back with four and the master was disappointed that he didn't come back with 10. No, wait, that's, that's, that's not it either. The servant who had two also doubled what he had, came back with four, and the master was pleased. He didn't come back with the same amount as servant number one, but he had done what he could with what he had to benefit his master. He worked with what he had and presented the results to his master. Just because we can't do what everyone else can do, just because we can't do what we used to do, there's no reason to give up and not even try to use our gifts and opportunities that God has given us to serve him and to make a difference for Jesus. God calls us to take what we're given, no matter how small it may seem, either in our eyes or when you compare it to others, to take what we've been given and to use it to bless others and to point them to the truth in Jesus. I was talking with someone this week and the subject of tithing came up. The concept of giving to the Lord 10% of what we receive. The biblical system of tithing is genius, I think. It's based not solely on, on what someone gives, but on what they have, but, but on what they have, it's based on what they have. That's why Jesus was able to look at this poor widow in a synagogue who dropped two pennies into the offering plate. And he was able to say that the Lord is more pleased with her than with the rich people who were giving thousands of dollars because he knew that she was giving all that she had. She had given out of her poverty. Let us do the most we can for the Lord with what he's given us. And the reward will be, well, not more money, more wealth. It will be more to be responsible for. 
to watch our gifts and abilities develop in service to the Lord, to have the privilege to be more and more a part of the work he wants to do on this earth. And our reward will be to feel God's joy, to feel the pleasure of our master, to share in his happiness, to know his joy as he sees us put to use what we've been given. One of my favorite movies is a movie called Chariots of Fire. I think it was the it was the best picture Oscar winner, I think, in 1980 or 81. The story is about a Scottish sprinter, 100-meter, 200-meter runner named Eric Liddell, and his attempt to win a gold medal for Great Britain in the 1924 Olympics. Now, Liddell was a Christian, a missionary's kid, and he himself felt called to the mission field, like his family, to go to China. And eventually in his life, he did go. There's an excellent biography of him, which, whose name escapes me. If you're interested in reading about him, let me know. Um, he's a fascinating man. But eventually he did go to China, but in 1924, he felt that what God wanted him to do was to run. And his family, his family didn't get that. And there's one scene in this movie where after Eric has spoken and shared his faith with a number of people, because he was able to use his platform as a famous runner to share the gospel with young people in particular, his sister kind of pulled him aside and started saying, Eric, you, you were made for China. Why are you wasting your time doing this? You need to go to the mission field. And Liddell responds to his sister by telling her that God had made him to be a runner as well. And he tells her, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. What is it that you do in life that when you do it, you feel God's pleasure? What is it in your life that makes you feel like you are sharing in your master's happiness? Invest your time, your energy, your resources, your money in those things, for they are most likely what you've been created for. Now the third servant, the conservative one, the risk-averse one, the one who feared failure and as such didn't stop and didn't step out and do anything with what he'd been given, the one who hid his light under a bushel the one who simply gave back to his master what he had been given in the first place. Master's response, well, honestly, seemed, was kind of harsh. He called the servant wicked. He chided the servant for his laziness. He told him that, well, at the very least, he could have stuck it in the bank and gotten me today, what, 0.0001% interest. Could have gotten me something more than what I gave you. But the servant had done nothing with what he had been given. The master took the one bag of gold away from that servant, and he gave it to the one who had ten. And then, calling the servant worthless, he banished him from his household. But, but wait a minute, hang on. We're not saved by our works. We're not saved by the things we do. We're saved by faith. We're saved by grace. If we've accepted Jesus as our, as our Savior, God won't banish us out of his kingdom. Well, it's true. But in the book of James, we're offered an important counterweight when it tells us that faith without works is dead. We should never assume that a faith that we allow to lie dormant, a faith that is not caught up in doing the things that God has called us to do, we should never assume that that faith will still be alive when we're called to give an account to God at the end of life or at the end of time. When it comes to our faith, it's just like anything else in life. Use it or lose it. Because we never know when the master might call us to settle accounts. Never know when we might be called to display what we've done with what we've been given. And as we said before, the main theme of this and, uh, and the parable surrounding it is to be ready. To know that if we are called to show what we've done with what we've given, we would not be ashamed. Now, now if, we sh if we feel ashamed because we haven't done what everyone else has done, well, that's not right. We shouldn't. And if we feel ashamed because we haven't done what, maybe what we might have done 40 years ago, well, that's not right either. We shouldn't. But to stand before the Lord one day and just give him back his gift and having done nothing with it, 
God has given each one of us a bag of gold. Gifts, abilities, responsibilities, personalities that he expects us to do something with for his honor and for his glory. And the ones who share in God's joy, the ones who feel his pleasure, are the ones who step out and do something with what they've been given. This morning we want to ask ourselves as individuals and as a church, what are we going to do with what we've got? Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you for each person in this room. Thank you, Lord, for the, the unique gifts and talents and abilities and personalities that you've given them, the unique opportunities that you've given them. Each one in this room has an opportunity to bless other people in your name that I don't have and that others don't have. Lord, help us to accept the challenge to do something with what we've been given. Help us to put it front of mind to be able to find ways to bless other people, to influence other people, to point other people to Jesus by our actions, by our words, by the moving of your spirit. Lord, help us not to bury what you've given us Help us to return it to you, having grown, having developed, having been paid forward, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, just so you can keep focusing on the Lord. I want you to take a minute and just listen to him and talk to him. Ask him, Lord, what is it? What's, what's, what's the gift? What's the bag of gold that I buried? Is there something that... You know, you've been pushing at me to do in your kingdom that I've been putting off. Or maybe there's something that you used to do. I used to do so much more, and now I'm older, and I just can't do as much as I used to. Well, God's not finished with you yet. He has a plan and purpose, and sometimes it just takes a moment to stop and listen and hear what he has to say. Take a moment in this silence, just you and God. Make this message personal in your life. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. There's nothing we can do to earn your forgiveness, so just to ask for it. But we know that faith without works is dead. In order to grow in our faith, we need to use what you've given us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us all to hear your voice, help us all to find those ways in our individual lives, our individual circumstances, for you to work through us to make a difference in this world. Help us to find that thing that allows us to feel your pleasure and to see your hand at work in our lives. And help us as a church to find those things that, that make your heart sing that we'd feel your pleasure as well. That we as a body would, would find our unique ways to reach out to the community around us and to make a difference. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? 
you're welcome. If you want to um, visit a bit or chat a bit, just make sure you do it at a, a good distance from each other. And um, as we were playing this song in the chorus, it struck me, I will cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. And as I've heard that song over the years, I've, sometimes I think of the trophies as the things of this world that I put aside in order to gain Christ and gain heaven. But I think it could also be the trophies, meaning the things that we have, that have gathered in our name for the things that we've done for God. And we can look forward to that day when we stand before the Lord and lay our trophies before him and say, Lord, these are the things that you gave me the strength to do. These are the things that you enabled me to do so that I can make a difference in someone else's life. This is the person that I led to the Lord. I never thought I'd be able to do that, but you enabled me to be able to help them find Jesus. These are the trophies that we can lay before him at the end of time. And this is a reminder to me, I think to all of us, that we want as many as possible to be able to make our Father smile and to feel his pleasure. So may you this week become more and more aware of the gifts and the opportunities and the talents that God has given you. And may you find ways to use them for his purposes and for his kingdom. So glad you could be with us this morning. God bless you. Make sure you see Phyllis if you want to help out with the Christmas dinner.